ever. It's cloudy here. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's amazing here. And uh, it's, it's my honor to um, be able to continue this series in the book of Acts. And it may seem like we've been in this a long time, but I'm telling you, this is not a joke. You could literally, for years and years, uh, unpack what's happening, what God is doing, and how 2,000 years ago what took place in the time of the book of Acts is still impacting the church today. But if you're new or you haven't been paying attention or you haven't been here, uh, we're going through the book of Acts and we're looking at what God has been doing post the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And so the disciples see Jesus. He goes up into the clouds. He says, you know, wait uh, in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And then you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses. And from that point on, like everything is crushing in, in the early church. Like Peter, uh, the one who was scared to begin with, now he's preaching boldly. 3,000 people come to know Jesus uh, on the first day. I mean, you know, that's a, that's a decent service uh, for, for your first time, right? And, and everything's going great. They've got, I told you, they've got a church van already. Uh, it says literal first congregational uh, temple of the weight in Jerusalem to the Holy Spirit, dunamis power comes, church of God in Christ. Like that's all fits. Uh, on the van, and, it, and it's, they're killing it. But then you see, as is always the case when the gospel is proclaimed, there begins to be some opposition. Some things happen that aren't as perfect as it all started. Uh, it happens from the outside. You have the religious leaders. They get jealous. The magistrate and the Pharisees, they're upset about it. Uh, and then even from the inside, you have you know, Ananias, Sapphira, you have some issues within the church. You have some jealousy. You have some people saying, hey, we're not getting the same treatment as other people are getting. And so there's issues that, that take place within the church. And then in Acts chapter 13, you see for the first time, missionaries sent intentionally with the gospel of Jesus Christ to proclaim the good news uh, from the church in Antioch. And then last week, Pastor Caleb, who is seriously one of my favorite uh, communicators. I love him. I love listening to him teach. Uh, did an amazing job talking about just rebuilding the tabernacle uh, of David and how prayer and worship in our homes is really the model. Uh, and then I was like, man, Caleb had like a killer poem. I don't know if you were here, but it was like beautiful. You know, he's a songwriter and he's like a, you know, deep philosopher. And I was like, I can't do that. I don't have time. I don't even have the ability. Uh, so I wrote a limerick uh, for you guys that I'm going to share. And I think it could be equally impactful. It goes like this. There once was a Pharisee named Saul who, when he met Jesus, did fall. He was thrown off his horse and he went blind, of course. And now we all know him as Paul. There you go. So I don't want to brag, but <clears throat> that took three minutes in deep prayer. So I just want you guys to Please appreciate what I put into these messages. Okay. And now we're in Acts chapter 16. And uh, in Acts chapter 16, I was like, oh man, I'm going to crush this because I want to go straight to the conversion of the Philippi jailer. It's am amazing. Paul and Silas get thrown into prison. It's midnight. They're worshiping, singing hymns, praying. The other prisoners hear it and they're, they're inspired and they're listening. Suddenly there's an earthquake. And, and the chains fall off and the shackles are broken and they're delivered from prison. And then the jailer who's supposed to be watching them is, is like, oh no, this is going to be my fault. Uh, I'm going to get killed anyways. I'm not going to do that to my family. I'm, he's literally about to take his own life. Paul says, stop, don't do that. We're all here. It's okay. He preaches the gospel to him. Him and his entire family get baptized and get saved. Uh, and then Pastor Lee was like, actually, that's not what you'll be talking about. So if you enjoyed that message, I'm sorry. That's where it ends. Uh, he said, I want you to talk about why they got arrested. Why were they in prison? And, and what was uh, the context for that? And so that's where we're going to go. And it's a very unique encounter that leads to uh, them being thrown in prison. We're going to read about it in Acts chapter 16. So if you brought your Bibles, I'm going to start in verse 16. It says this, now it happened. As we, meaning Paul and Silas, went to prayer, the place of prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. And this girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates. And they said, these men being Jews exceedingly are troubling our city. And they're teaching customs which are not lawful for us as Romans to have to receive or observe. 
Then the multitudes, the crowds, rose up together against them. And the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded they be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And so having received such a charge, the jailer put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as your word is proclaimed, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate your word. God, we are asking for the spirit of God to take the word of God and to make it, God, impactful for each and every person listening. God, that's our heart. We want to encounter you. We want to encounter your presence. God, we're, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to move upon each room, each home, each household, and do what only you can do in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So this is what happened. Paul and Silas are going to prayer. They're teaching uh, about Jesus. And there's a girl who is being trafficked. She's a slave. She's a young girl, and she has a spirit. Bible says spirit of divination. Young's translation says literally a python spirit is upon her, and it's causing her to manifest some things. So she's able to tell the future to some degree, and so these people who own her, these men, are utilizing her to make a profit, and they're keeping her, uh, maybe against her will, maybe not, but she ends up following Paul and Silas as they're ministering, and she's declaring some things. She's saying that these are servants of the Most High God, and they're teaching you the way of salvation, and so scholars are a little bit uh, maybe uh, differentiated in what that actually means. Obviously, that's the truth. And they're telling the truth. And we see that in scripture other times when demonic forces um, are encountered. They'll say things like, what do you want with me, most high God? You know, and, and so it could be that. But also, most high God could have referred to Zeus. And the pagans would have understood it differently. So it's not necessarily that the demon was trying to help uh, you know, proclaim the gospel. Probably not the case. But this girl uh, ends up doing this to the degree that Paul, and the Bible says, becomes greatly annoyed. That's not a great translation. It wasn't like, I lost my temper in a moment. But this was going on for days. It's probably a distraction. It's bringing unwanted attention to them, and it's diverting from the message they're trying to preach. So Paul gets to this place, and it's, it's contrary to God. It's not the Spirit of God. And so he says, I'll come out, and this girl's delivered. And, and obviously in this room, uh, most of us are thinking, that's great. But they're the People are upset. They're angry. They saw their, you know, hopes of making fortunes off of this girl go up in smoke. And so there's a big riot. They get the crowd on their side and they get thrown into prison. But it brings us to a place where we have to address what is the role of the demonic or the role of the spirit realm or even the evil spirits in the lives of people today, specifically in Christians today. So this is a heavy topic, quite honestly. And it's something that is not always addressed. It's not always easy to talk about. We never heard about it at all in the church I grew up in. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit much, and we didn't talk about demons uh, much. And so I want to just address this, not in a teaching way, not in a super academic way. If you're interested in that, Michael Heiser has written a book called The Unseen Realm and also a book on angels and demons. It's phenomenal. I want to address this pastorally. And I want to address it in ways that I've seen it impact my life and in the lives of people I've had the privilege of pastoring for, for almost 20 years. So um, we're going we're gonna to look at what does it mean for us today to understand, comprehend, and walk in the reality of how the demonic, demonic realm affects us. And so the first thing I, I want us to realize is spiritual warfare is real. Like that's, that's happening around you. Whether you know it or not, there is an unseen realm. There are spirits. There are demons and there are angels. And there is an uh, enemy of your soul named Satan, who is a fallen angel, uh, whose entire focus and entire uh, reason for existence right now is to combat and to undo everything that the Lord is doing. The Bible says in John 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is Satan's entire mandate uh, in life. And so he he goes about and he attempts to disrupt. He attempts to submarine people's faith. He attempts to impact people negatively. And that's a real thing. And there are spirits and there are principalities and powers. Ephesians 6, Paul says this. He says, be strong in the Lord, verse 10, and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And then verse 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our war is not against people, but against principalities powers, 
rulers, spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenlies. Like those aren't even all the same, different words for the same thing. Those are like classes uh, and, and different strategies of the demonic. But he says that is literally where the war is. And so there is a real battle going on. And, and uh, I want to read this quote from C.S. Lewis. Because we can, especially as Christians, fall into like two camps when it comes to the devil. And he says this, there are two equal but opposite errors Christians can commit when thinking about the devil. The first is to think too little, to remain blissfully ignorant of his schemes and tactics, and to fail to realize that he's crafty and scheming. Fail to consider carefully all that scriptures say about our adversary. This error leaves us an easy target and unprepared to withstand the devil's schemes. The other error is to think too much of the devil, to fixate on him, to ascribe to him too much power, to fail to realize the victory that Christ has won and is winning for us, and then to see him literally everywhere and in everything. This error can make us obsessive and paralyze us with fear. Most tragically, it downplays the power and the authority and the victory of Christ. And so those are two responses that C.S. Lewis says you got to be mindful of. First, we can't be ignorant. The Bible says literally, do not be ignorant. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices, his schemes, and his craftiness. And so we don't want to walk through thinking that there's no such thing. Like that doesn't help us as Christians. But then also the other side, uh, pendulum swing, is we give too much credit. And the devil's too powerful and he's in charge of everything. And anything that happens is, is always the devil and it's always this. And, and, and we start acting as if he's as powerful or he's the same as God. Or there's this, like this weird, like I'm going to be super spiritual and, and I can't even use a dirt devil vacuum or... I can't ride in a helicopter. I, I go in heaven copters, or I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. And I'm just like, okay, great. I'm sorry that the English language has done this to us. But either way, uh, but, but the reality is, and this is true, is that Satan is not like God in the sense that he's, you know, the bad version of God. He is a created being. He is finite. He fell from heaven. And he knows that his time is short. And so he is working furiously to oppose everything that God is doing. But he was stripped of all his power. He has no authority, but his power was taken from him at the cross. And it was made a spectacle of at Calvary. Exactly. And ultimately, he will be judged. He will be defeated. And he will spend eternity in a lake of fire with every single demon in hell. That is the future of Satan. And so we don't, we don't want to have this idea that, oh, we have to always be freaking out about him, but at the same time, we don't want to be ignorant of him. And so what does that look like? We understand spiritual warfare is real. There is an unseen realm, but how should that and does that affect us as Christians? And the first thing I want to say about it is demons operate in environments. They need an environment to operate. And so people will always ask me, like, can a Christian be demon-possessed? Like, that's a big, big question. And I think sometimes we compartmentalize too much. And if you're asking, because we see movies and The Exorcist and stuff, so if you're asking me, is, can a Christian, someone with the Spirit of God in them, be completely possessed where they have no, you know, function of their own and they're at the uh, uh, will and mercy of the demonic? Like, you don't see that in Scripture. You don't see that happen to Christians, uh, which is why the Bible says to Christians, don't cast out the devil, resist the devil. James 4, 8, resist the devil and he will flee from you. First Peter 5 says that our enemy walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. And so there are environments where the demonic and, and the, the satanic realm is easier to access and has an easier time um, impacting our lives. So I don't know that, I don't want to say, yeah, Christians can be demon possessed, but can they be demon oppressed? Absolutely. Can they be demonically influenced? Absolutely. If you don't think that's true, you have not read your Bible. It happens all throughout scripture. In the Old Testament, you see Samson. He was a judge. He was separated at birth for a calling to deliver the people of Israel. He had supernatural strength. He had all of these things going for him, but he also had a, a hey there Delilah issue that he didn't deal with. And time after time, he continued to kind of give in to this flesh and give in to this lust, and it ended up costing him. Even though he had a calling, even though he was a Christian, he was demonically oppressed and influenced, and it cost him. And then you look at Judas in the New Testament. I don't know if I need to remind you, but Judas heard every single sermon Jesus ever preached. And the Bible says that Satan entered his heart. There was a moment where a woman was worshiping 
and, and extravagantly and broke this expensive jar and there were already some issues going on with, with, with Judas and he was like, that could have been sold and given to the poor and Jesus rebuked him and the Bible says in that moment when he was corrected, when he was offended, something came into his heart and he began to plot and he began to plan and obviously he betrayed Jesus, but he was a disciple. So this idea, Jesus even said to, to Peter and the disciples, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to crush you. He wants, but I've been praying strength for you. So don't, don't be... Don't assume that because you're a Christian, you cannot be demonically influenced. You absolutely can, and it does happen. But there has to be an environment for that. So I'm going to do this quickly, and I'm going to run through these. Um, but, but they're real. And so these are things. Here's how I, the heading I gave it. Not everything spiritual is holy. Not everything spiritual is holy. We live in a, in a culture that wants to be, yeah, I'm not real religious, man. I'm spiritual. Like, I don't, I'm not sure what that means, but I want you to hear that's not always a good thing. That's not always a good confession. That's not always a good understanding of what's going on. And so not everything that happens spiritually is godly or is holy. And so here are some things that are environments where the satanic and the demonic have better chance, better ability to reign and rule. First, obviously, are things like witchcraft and Wiccan. And you may be like, what? What is that? That's the movies. I'm telling you, that is on the rise in our culture and in our country. Spiritually, uh, even things like spells and Wiccans and witchcraft, it is, it is a real thing in our country. And obviously, it's demonic. We have a new age philosophies that are kind of sometimes masked in Christianity, that everything's within you. You, you're, you have the ultimate power. You can do it. Channel your own energy. Like, that's not the gospel, and that's not the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, that's demonic. Christianity is not a self-help. It is not Tony Robbins. It is not... Oprah. It is not any of those people. It is, I can't do it. Jesus did do it. And now my faith is in him. And that's how I'm saved. So, so there's this weird new age stuff that's going on. And then even like this Eastern mysticism and, and where it's like, I'm going to empty my mind. And I'm going to like, the Bible never says empty your mind. The Bible says, renew your mind according to the truth that's in Christ Jesus. And, and people be like, so what does that mean? Like, I can't do yoga. I'm like, I don't know. Sure. I can't do yoga. Like literally. And I'm not sure, again, this is just me, that you should do yoga with goats. Apparently that's a thing. That's probably demonic. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know for sure. But look, obviously you can do some of those things. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily, yoga isn't. But again, this Eastern mysticism that, that creeps in, those are, I call it gateways or environments for it. And hopefully you realize that. But here's some other ones. Spiritual outlets. Things like Ouija boards. Things like tarot cards. Psychics mediums, palm readers, think those are not the Holy Spirit and they're not healthy and they're not good. And, and they are again, getting like sort of included in some Christian circles. Like I can talk to your dead relatives. Like that is not your dead relative. That is a demon and that is not good. And you don't want to do that. And I'm not saying you can't go to the, the, you know, cemetery and, and, and put flowers down and honor things. But you need to know that that is a body and who that person really is, is no longer there. And if you can talk to that person on this side of eternity, I'm telling you that is not good. And that is not necessarily God. And, and so we have these, and, and Ouija board, oh, I'm just messing around and I'm going to get my palm read. All of those. And I'm not saying everyone who does that is demon possessed. I'm saying those are environments where the demonic can move. So be very careful. And I would say pastorally, don't do those things. I don't, honestly, I, don't, I didn't even know I was on vacation with Kendra and we were talking to someone. I didn't know they were from Canada. Not that that is bad, but sorry. Um, and, and they were, I was telling them something that happened to us. And then he goes, he goes, oh man, are you, can, are you a cancer? I was like, guy, I hope not. <laughs> I, I don't know. And he goes, no, like your sign. I was like, oh, dude, I have no idea. I don't know any of those things. Uh, and it turns out I'm a Virgo apparently. And then he looked up my birthday, August 31. Write that down if you're taking notes. Please. No, I'm just kidding. And it had all this crazy, like, who I'm going to be as a family man, who I'm going to be as a da-da-da. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Oh, they copied this from, from a Tony Robbins book, and they're just kept, you know, but, but people get brought into that, and, it's, and it's, it's not healthy. It's not good. It's not God. Excessive alcohol and drug use. Obviously, you see that, um, how that impacts people. Um, Illicit sexual relationships, things that are outside of the covenant of marriage, this whole guy's hookup culture that we have, this whole like Tinder swiping thing, like I'm just going to meet up with people. Maybe you're not aware of that, but that is a thing. 
and then they just have sex together and they act like, oh, it's just this physical thing. And it's not, it's spiritual, it's emotional. The, the Bible says two become one and, and whatever they have, you're taking in. Like there is, the demonic is within that and, and we need to understand that. Unforgiveness, unresolved anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the enemy a, a small way to kind of like get leverage in your life. All of these are footholds. Last one is, is demonic like movies and music. And I always get a bunch of grief for that too. Like, oh my word, John, you're so legalistic. I'm like, look, I, I can't stand horror movies. I'm just going to tell you. I watched Nightmare on Elm Street as like a sixth or seventh grader. I'm telling you, I didn't sleep for a month. And I was so jacked up from that and scared. And I just don't like them. And, and some people do like them. But I'm going to say this. If you're one of those, like, you know what? I like those like Saw movies where it's just like gratuitous violence and I'm hacking, like, then you, you may actually need some help. <laughs> but, but some people are like, oh, I like the scary things and the, the you know, jump out of a cloud. Like, great. I, I'm not here to, to say that. But also our, our music choices. Like, just be careful about that. I'm, again, in the 80s, I went to this Christian camp and they told us about backmasking and how you played these like Ozzy Osbourne things backwards. It's like, the devil, blah, 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 the devil. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't sleep for another month. Um, but people, here's what I'll say when it comes to that. I don't want to be your Holy Spirit. But, and people will say, oh, it's legalistic. I, to me, the only difference between holiness and legalism is your motives. If your motive is, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, and it's make me better, and it's going to make God happy, and I'm going to look better, then that's legalism. If your motive is, I don't want that in my heart because it's not in God's heart. I don't want that in my life because it's not in God's life because it doesn't pass the Philippians 4, 8 test of things that are good and pure and kind and winsome. Well, then that to me is holiness. And that to me says, I'm not going to just do anything that everybody else is doing. So those are environments. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wow. We're doing great on time. Praise God. Here we go. Um, Okay, so you might be here and say, John, I'm not actively doing those things. I'm not a witch. I don't even go out on Halloween. Well, praise God. You're, you're uh, better than most of us. I'm just kidding. But you might be saying, but what about me? What, what are other ways? And, and I'm not going to teach. Again, I don't want to go into to demonology here, and I don't want to make this a, a hardcore uh, class. But I do want to just briefly say there's really three general types of demonic influence that do affect us as Christians. And I think this is important for us to hear. And it doesn't mean if this is happening to you that, that like I said, that you're involved in one of those things or uh, you're, you're on that list that I just gave, but this is a reality in the lives of believers. And so there, there's three general types. The first is, is territorial and they're called principalities in that Ephesians 6, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And they're principalities that want to control geographical areas or even institutions and institutions or uh, an institute their way over certain regions. And so you see that. You see that in our country. What do people call Las Vegas? Sin City. Like I guarantee you, there are demonic strongholds that are there. What, in New York and LA and Hollywood, like in, in the you know, industries like entertainment. If you don't think there's demonic spirits in entertainment, you're wrong. There absolutely is, and they want control over that. Washington, D.C., God help us. I'm going to tell you, there are some demonic spirits and strongholds that are trying to say, no, this is the answer. Politics is the answer. If we only had this, it's all their fault. Like that, that is demonic in nature, and they're territorial. And we see it even in our own city, downtown. I don't know if you know this, but not everybody's thrilled uh, that we're downtown. And, and I've said this in a few messages ago, but I think there's some demons that are getting their feathers ruffled a little bit that are territorial. And you know why? Because 15 times a week, prayer, intercessor, and worship is happening right in the heart of downtown at the Radiant City Center. And that's what, that's what needs to happen to break territorial de demonic influences is people, communities of believers need to come together and pray and prophesy and worship and say, no, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's how you break spiritual strongholds and bondages within your city. So there's territorial, but there's also deceiving. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Paul says, uh, in the latter days, the Spirit explicitly says that there will be those who abandon their faith and adopt doctrines of demons and, and listen to deceiving spirits. And again, I don't have time to unpack all of that. And some of it, again, as I said, is the palm reading and the tarot card and all this horoscope stuff that, that our culture is obsessed with. But there's also that creeping into the church of Jesus Christ where we're 
taking the gospel and we're rewriting it and we're watering it down and we're trying to make it more palpable and more acceptable and, and we need the church to be more loving. You know, if the church changed their stance on this, someone said that to me, then, then people would know the church is more loving. I said, I disagree. Jesus Christ. Now, we're never going to be more loving than Jesus. Jesus came as perfect love and he got crucified. So it's going to be tough to, to, to combat that or to do better than Jesus did. And they didn't accept his message. So again, we need to, to understand there is doctrines of demons that go out that want to twist the, the scriptures, want to pull people away, want to get them to believe things that simply are not true about the Bible. And, and there are demons who do that and who are in charge of that. And I hate to say it, but people are being swept away into that. We know that. But the third one, and I want to spend the rest of our time on this because pastorally, I feel like this happens a lot, is there really are vexing or even tormenting, they're called demonic spirits. And they're influences that personally come and they attack your mind, your will, and your emotions, your soul realm. And this manifests in many different ways. But what commonly happens is people begin to have just a deep heaviness on their life. They begin to have, maybe it's anxiety or depression or this like uh, uh, oppression. I just, I, I, I feel this weight or I can't get free. And, and then the enemy comes and he brings these voices. He speaks to our minds. That's generally how we're tempted. You know, when Jesus was tempted in, in the wilderness to, to, you know, make the stones bread and that wasn't Satan showing up with like a pitchfork, you know, in a red suit, like, hey, I'm Lucy Fur and I want to ruin your life. You like that? It, it was thoughts. He was alone and thoughts came into his mind. Like, what if I did it this way? What if I could avoid? And that is what the enemy does to believers. And he gets you to listen to, you know what? You're always going to struggle. You're never going to be free. That's always going to be an issue. Your kids aren't going to serve God. That's always going to have that effect on you. And it, intensifies. Let me just tell you, church, the devil never has a moment where he goes, you know what? They've probably had enough. Or I'm going to, you know, what? I'm going to ease up a little bit on, on Nancy. This is getting hard for her. No, it is going to compound. And then people hear that voice, you know, maybe the world would be better without me. Maybe no one would miss me. Maybe it'd be better if I wasn't here. This is never going to happen for me. And, and the enemy brings, and it's demonic, obviously, these heaviness and this depression, this anxiety and this vo and these voices into the minds of believers. And he, and he gets us to want to believe that. He gets to, to want that to be true for us. He wants us to sign off on that. And, and then suddenly we're in this place. And again, I'm not saying if, if you're doing this, but people are cutting and harming themselves. There's, there's all this gender confusion. There, there's so many things that are happening, especially within young people. And I'm not saying you're demon possessed. I'm saying that it's not the spirit of God that is influencing you to do that. It is a demonic spirit that wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything God has deposited in your heart and life. That's what it is. And so the question has to then become, what do we do about it? Because here's what I've seen in 20 years of, of, of ministry. It's too many Christians even don't know that they have an arsenal, don't know that there is a spiritual battle happening, and they think they just have to kind of bear it. Or they think they just got to kind of like, oh, I hope this goes away. I hope this gets better. I, 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 oh, and they're just kind of gritting their teeth, and I got to get through it. And listen, there, there is the aspect of perseverance. There is the aspect of waiting on the Lord, but you have spiritual weapons at your disposal that God has given you. And that I want to talk to us about, and I want to make you aware of so that you're not suffering to the degree that you are. And listen, I, I remember personally, in 1999, I gave my heart to the Lord in this very church and, and coming out of a, a place of just drugs and alcohol and illicit lifestyle. And, and I, I suffered from night terrors and I never dream like I'm out. Like I don't hardly remember it, but I was having these intense dreams where I was, and I still remember it was sleeping, but not in like my bed, like on a cot. And I had like just one little blanket over me and I would hear this voice and it was a dog. It was like a, a wolf dog. And he'd be right in my, like, like here I'm right in my face. And then I'd turn and turn, you know, like you do in bed, turn the other, and then he'd be right there. And it was obviously dark and it was scary. And, and I heard a voice say, you don't think I'm going to let you go this easy. And I remember talking to Pastor Lee and Jane and, and getting prayer and getting people to pray for. And it was the first time I've ever experienced anything like that. And the reality is the whole time I was living for the 
devil. He didn't have to come visit me at night. He didn't have to attack my dreams. I was doing everything on my own. I didn't need motivation. But suddenly I'm like, no, I, I'm, I'm experiencing freedom and here's Jesus and I'm, I'm memorizing the word and I'm, I'm walking in, in his calling and that's when the demonic came and, and, and I'm not saying like, I think I'm demon possessed. I was like, there's gotta be a way that we can fight this and combat this and come against this. And, and that is the call of every single believer is to fight the battle in the spiritual. It's not natural. It's not, the weapons are, are, are not carnal that we're fighting with. So it's not your education. It's not your money. It's not your resources. It's not even your best efforts. There are three things I want to highlight when it comes to fighting with the spiritual weapons God gives us. And you, you write this down, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. You should memorize this scripture if you haven't. Paul says this, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting off every you know, uh, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then he says, and you bring every thought into obedience or into captivity and bring it into the obedience of Christ. So you take your thoughts captive and you bring it into the obedience of Christ. That is what spiritual warfare for you as an individual looks like. So there's three things I just want you to remember when these things are happening to you. The first is your identity, who you are. You are a child of God. You are, 1 John 3 says, behold, what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, but that's what we are. God has adopted you into his family. God has made all things new in your life. And 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but it's a power, love, and a sound mind. So the very first thing when the enemy comes to attack you is you remind him, I am a child of God. I am not a slave to fear. I am not a slave to my feelings. I am not bound by anything other than the love of Christ, which compels me. And you say those things out loud to yourself and to the enemy. That's number one, your identity. It's not found in anything else than Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. And Colossians 2 says he disarmed every principality. He took the handwriting of requirements and he removed it. And now it's not your righteousness, it's his. And so your identity is found in him. That's number one. But number two is you have to understand the truth. The truth. When you're in these battles, guys, the enemy only knows how to speak lies. That's all he knows. He's the father of lies. He can't tell the truth. And so when you're hearing these voices, when these thoughts are coming, you immediately say, this is not true. That's what taking your thoughts captive means. And then you bring it. What does it mean to bring it into the obedience of Christ? You speak the actual truth from God's word over yourself and your situation. That's what it is. That's spiritual warfare. It's not ethereal. It's not crazy. It is saying, no, that isn't true. This is what's true. And you speak the word of God over yourself. No, no, no. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who has set me free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so I'm not bound. And, and, and I may ha be having a heaviness or a depression. I'm not minimizing that. But the Bible says this. I've given you a garment, Isaiah 61, a praise for a spirit of heaviness. When you're feeling that heaviness, that darkness, that depression, I promise you, if you will worship, doesn't matter if you feel it. Doesn't matter if you can sing. Doesn't matter if you can write a limerick. You start worshiping, praising God for, for who he is and what he's done. And it will remove, it will begin to assault that spirit of heaviness that's in your life. They cannot, the, the demonic cre uh, people, creatures in hell cannot stand the sound of worship, cannot stand the sound of praise. And so you don't have to feel it. It doesn't have to be in church. Sing. Say, I have a spirit of praise for this garment of heaviness. And listen, I'm not here to say, Depression isn't real, and that's all you need to do, and you don't need Medicaid. But I am saying this. Go to the Word of God and His promises before you do anything else when you experience these thoughts and these voices, when you have that heaviness, that despair, that anxiety. Philippians 4 says, no, I'd be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, I'm going to make my request known to God. And then what's the result? The peace of God that passes understanding will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 8 should be memorized by Christians. And when those anxious thoughts come, that's how you take it captive and say, no, that's not true. This is true. God is in control. He has the whole world in his hands. God is for me, not against me. And you begin to speak the truth of God's word over your life. That's, that's what it looks like to be free. That's what it looks like to break bondages in your life. It's not always instantaneous. It's not like abracadabra. It's, it's understanding who you are and then speaking the truth. But, but, and I'm just going to say it, John 
8 says, and you shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will set you free. Too many Christians don't really know the truth. They don't know the word of God and they don't know the promises. And so then they're, they're, they're trying to pull a sword to, to do battle and they don't have one. They, they haven't built one in the secret place. And so I say this not to condemn anyone about your knowledge of scripture. You don't have to be a theologian, but you better know what Jesus said about you and what God said is true because the enemy is going to give you every single lie that he can. Last thing is this is the church. You need the church. You need accountability in your life. You need to understand that the Bible says a three-chord strand isn't easily broken, but when you're by yourself, the enemy wants to isolate you. But two is better than one. People in your life, people in your small group, when we come together in worship, there is power in corporate worship, corporate praise. And I feel like, I'm not just saying this because I'm a pastor, but more and more people are like, yeah, I don't really need church. I don't really need to go. I got a, this podcast and I watch this on YouTube and that's great. But that is not the same as being in the house of God with the saints of God, worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we need the church. We need each other. We need the body of Christ and the body of Christ needs you, needs your voice needs your skill set, needs your anointing and, and, and what God's placed inside of you. That's how we combat. We don't put our head in the sand and go, no, this can't be demonic because I'm a Christian. It very well can be. And we don't ascribe to, to, to Satan the same power and glory that God has. Of course not. What we do is we take the spiritual weapons that God has given to us and we say, God, this is who I am. This is what you've said. This is what I know is true. And we rest in what he's done and how he has already won the victory. And we stand. We stand. And when we've done everything else, we just keep standing. And who God is and what he's done. Will you stand up with me? I want to, I want to take communion together. And I wanted to do it at the end because I feel like Jesus said, when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so I want us to remember the power and blood and broken body of Jesus in our lives. And primarily, I wanted to have an opportunity for those of us in this room, Portage Online, who may say, you know what, I have been involved in some things that have created an environment maybe for the demonic to move. I have maybe opened up some, some doors in my life, maybe unintentionally, maybe it's an anger issue, maybe it's something you, you haven't let go of in your past, or maybe you're dabbling in some things, or maybe you're full board in, into witchcraft or, or, or something that you shouldn't be. I don't know, but God does, and here's what I want you to know is you are only one prayer, one prayer, one drop of the blood of Jesus away from freedom from forgiveness and from walking in the power and authority God has for you. You don't have to grovel. You don't have to beg. You don't have to lament every wrong thing you've done. You have to say, Jesus, I repent. I turn my heart from that and I turn it towards you. And I put my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. God is here and God is for you. And God is always enough. He's always enough. So I want us to, to take the bread if we can. And the Bible says that it's for our healing, that it's the broken body of Jesus that brings healing. And, I, and I, I believe that God means that physically, but also emotionally, spiritually. Um, God wants to do a healing work. And so as we take this together, I just want you to ask the Lord, like, where are the parts of my body, my soul, my heart that needs the healing, the broken body of Jesus to touch and to supernaturally bring his healing and his power to you. Let's take the bread together. And then the Bible says Jesus took a cup and he poured it and he said, this is my blood spilled, shed for the complete remission of all of your sins. Every sin is under the blood of Jesus. Every single thing that you've done wrong is under the blood of Jesus as soon as you take it to the cross, as soon as you turn, as soon as you repent and say, God, not my ways, but your ways. Jesus is there. You draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And so right now, I want to just take a moment and I want you to just 
in your own mind. You don't have to say it out loud, but just give the Lord whatever he's highlighting, whatever the Holy Spirit is bringing to your attention. Maybe it's something from your past, something you're working through, a relationship you're in, something that you know is not pleasing to God, and just give it to him. And we're going to put it under the blood of Jesus. But just ask the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to take a few, a few moments. Take the cup together. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. And God, right now, I speak to the radiant church, to everyone who's listening online. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I declare, God, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are sons and daughters of the living God. And it is your voice and your heart and your truth that marks us and defines us. Our identity is found in you. So I break right now the power of the enemy, God. He has no authority, but his power is broken in Jesus' name. And we declare freedom in this room, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from our past, freedom from the accusations, God. And we raise up a banner, God, of love that you have put over us. And we say, Father, bring us into relationship with you. Bring us into our true identity. And God, for those who are in a place, God, where they're sensing despair, where there's heaviness and oppression, God, bring a garment of praise. Break that heavy yoke, God. Give them your burden that's light, your yoke that's easy. And we speak the truth of the word of God that where your spirit is, there is freedom. And it is for freedom that you have set us free. So God, let freedom reign. Let joy fill your house and let every person walk in the identity of who they are in Christ Jesus from this moment on. You have given us weapons of warfare, God, and we don't always get it right, and we don't always have uh, the ability in, in ourselves, but you have made a way, and we trust you, and we stand on your truth and on your word, and we give you the glory. You, the greater one, is in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward, and listen, I've asked them to be 